Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I want to talk today about a tool uh, I've developed called Recipe. Now, I want to start off with a, a brief sort of situation. Have you ever been in this situation? You've created a wonderful looking graph. Now, that's not a wonderful looking graph. I, I, I'm sure you'll agree, but it's a graph. And you created it, and then, I don't know, six months later, you come back and you go, I want to put that graph in my paper, or my PhD thesis, or my research report, or whatever it is you're, you're writing. But you can't remember how it was you generated the graph. You can't remember what parameters you used for your algorithm, or what input files you used. Who's been in that sort of situation? Anyone? Anyone want to admit that? Yep, I have definitely. Half of my PhD thesis, I ended up going back trying to work out what on earth I'd done to produce that wonderful looking image, and why I couldn't get it to work again. Well, Recipe manages to potentially solve this problem, because it's, you know, it's a big problem. People try to do stuff, they can't work out how it was done in the past. They've got this wonderful result, this wonderful result. They could you know, win them a Nobel Prize or something when they publish it, but they never quite managed to actually do that, because they've forgotten exactly how they, how they went about producing it. So, I wanted to come up with a way of, of solving this, but there were two main requirements. And the first one was that it must be really easy, because I'm really lazy. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are as well, and definitely people who really don't like programming, who are kind of people who probably aren't, aren't here at this sort of conference, really don't want to learn how to use some fancy new tool to, to do all of this. Um, and it also must work with whatever libraries you're using without actually requiring the libraries to be modified. So there's no point in me coming up with a wonderful thing that requires me to go off to NumPy and SciPy and Scikit-Image and Scikit-Learn and all these people and go, can you please do this so that we can do this? Because you know, that's going to take quite a while if it ever happens. Um, so when I tried to develop this, um, I came up with an idea which I proposed at the Software Sustainability Institute's Collaboration Workshop 2015. Uh, now, who's heard of the Software Sustainability Institute? A few people, yep. It's a, um, you, if you, for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a UK uh, institute funded by uh, most of the research councils looking at software and science, how we can make it sustainable, reproducible, and so on. And they hold this great workshop called the Collaborations Workshop uh, in Oxford, in fact, which is probably a, a place I'm not meant to mention when I'm in Cambridge. Um, and I proposed this idea at the Hack Day and got a team together, and we developed... Um, the very first version of Recipe. Now, unfortunately, Yannicka can't be here today, but Raquel is here. Give us a wave. If you want to ask other questions about, about Recipe, come and ask Raquel afterwards as well. Um, and in fact, we won the, the hack day. You can see us holding our, our iPad tablets there. So what is Recipe? Well, Recipe is a Python module, um, which basically does this for you and solves this problem. So if you take a bit of code like this, now this isn't, isn't wonderful code by any means, but you know, it's fairly simple standard code. It, it reads in a CSV, does some plotting, saves a graph, uh, does a bit of manipulation. I'm not quite sure why we're mod multiplying temperature by 100. That doesn't seem to make much sense, but never mind. Um, and, and saves it to, a, to an output file. Now, to make Recipe track this properly, all you need to do is have one line of code, import Recipe at the top. That's it. And that was the bit that I was really quite pleased about being able to do, because that is, lazy people can do that. It's what? 10 characters, maybe, 12, it's not difficult. And what happens then is that when you have this import recipe statement at the top, it uh, goes off and does a bit of setting up, getting, getting things ready so that you can use it. And then all of the input and output files use monkey patched hooks, I'll explain what they are in a moment, to basically write the information about what you're, import, what you're using as input, what you're using as output into a database. And then you've just got a couple of nice little tools, uh, a command line tool and a GUI tool to query this database and find out basically what you did. So, monkey patching. The problem is, if what we want to do here is we want to record what's happened, so where we've taken input from, where we've written output to, so we can then come back and go, okay, we're not, you know, the thing I wrote output to, graph.png, it actually came from, from this script and, and this particular run of the script. But there's no easy way of doing that that's built in. So there isn't a kind of on-save hook in, in NumPy or, or Pandas or anything that says, you know, before you call the read CSV function, please you know, call my thing first to log it. What we actually need to do is we need to patch this code at runtime to enable it to do this. Now, that's known as monkey patching. Apparently, that actually came from guerrilla patching, guerrilla as in G-U-E, as in guerrilla warfare, um, which then turned into guerrilla patching the normal way and then eventually turned into monkey patching, hence the... Um, Hence the picture. 
Um, and basically, what we do is something a little bit like this. Uh, this is a very simple example. But basically, we write a function that wraps around something like pandas read CSV function, um, which we basically just, in this case, print out a little thing saying, you called it. But in, that case, in, in Restify's case, we actually log what the arguments were and, and where you wrote things to and so on. Um, so then you just assign that, as it were, to pd.readcsv, and that's what you're going to be able to use uh, from then on in your, in your code. Now, that's actually a very simple example. There's a number of um, slightly tricky technicalities to do to get this to work in practice so that you can still do all your introspection and your doc strings, and so you can still do tab completion and all of this kind of stuff. Um, so we, in fact, wrap that uh, internally in Recipe. We wrap that in a little function just called patch function. So we give it a module like pandas, a function like read CSV, uh, and then a wrapper function that we want to call before we, before we sort of actually call read CSV itself. So obviously, once we've got this sort of monkey patching work, we've got a way, as you can see here, of printing out that we've called this. But printing out, you know, you've written something to a CSV in, in a script that you know is writing something to a CSV isn't uh, particularly useful. So you actually want to store it somewhere. Uh, so we originally started off storing it uh, in MongoDB using NoSQL databases, like all the cool kids are using these days. Uh, but actually, in this situation, it was actually probably a sensible choice, I think. Um, and um, you know, Mongo's a, a sort of client-server NoSQL database, um, but it's a bit of a pain to install and get running. You can't just do pip install recipe and get it working if you're using something like Mongo because you've got to make sure you've got a Mongo server running, you've got to install that separately. That's different for Windows and Linux and Mac, and it's all a real pain. There are some benefits, though. It, it can be a remote server, so you can share things. It can be scalable and, and so on. What we're actually using in Recipe at the moment, uh, we did a, sort of a change a few, just about a few weeks ago, actually, um, maybe one week ago, <laughs> um, is something called TinyDB, which is a pure Python NoSQL database. So there's no separate installing. It's just a, 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 a Python module that can come in via pip. Uh, it's JSON-based. Not sure what the scalability is going to be like. It may be that in the future we go into an option where you can choose to either store in, in TinyDB or if you want to go through the extra setup, you can store in something like, in something like Mongo. But we'll, we'll cross that bridge a bit later on down the line. Um, what I've realized is that I've actually completely forgotten to stop and do the demonstration of how this works. So do let me pause a second and uh, move into a demonstration. Now, can you see the terminal here? Is that big enough for everybody? Yeah? Whoops, that's not the right terminal. Here we are. Right, so we've got this Python script, uh, basically the same sort of script that I showed you earlier. Um, you can see it's, it's a very simple script. Now, as you see, we've got import recipe up the top there. So let's try running this script. Just very simply, oops, Python example script. Uh, now, the time it's taking is nothing to do with recipe, by the way. It's just that my laptop's very slow. Um, you can see that it's popped up a little message saying it's inserted a recipe run with a, a unique ID there. And then the rest of the script is just running as normal. If we look at what we've got here, you can see we've got a graph output. We've also got whoops, um, a CSV output from pandas there. Now, that's great. Imagine we now do the time travel and fast forward six months, and you want to go, OK, how did I actually create that graph.png script? You can use the recipe command line tool. Uh, if we look at its help, you can see we've got various options. We can search for uh, files. We've got a little GUI we can use as well and, and various other um, more advanced options, but very simply, we can just do something like recipe search graph.png, and that looks for any recipe runs that created this, this graph.png file. And you can see that you get quite a lot of information here. So you get the run ID. It tells you it was created by me, when. Um, it's, uh, that's a UTC time, by the way, so it's, it, you, know, you can sort of compare things. That's why it says 9.41, not, not 10.41. Um, it tells you what script you ran, uh, what Python version you did, it even tells you information about Git. Um, so that's all the information about kind of the, the code you're running in the environment. But then it also lists all the inputs and outputs. So you can go, OK, well, I've, I've found what, what produced graph.png. I'd really like to look at the output. This is the output um, that, that it created. Um, and so you can sort of link them all together. Um, if I were to do this again, um, you can see, let's just... Um, Um, let's change this, so that, that was actually in Kelvin, but let's change it to my silly times 100 thing again. 
with a different output, a very sensible name, output two, um, and run it again. Um, it does exactly the same sort of thing it did last time, and um, then when it's finished, uh, you can run the same sort of command you did last time, and this time it will pop up a little thing saying, just to let you know, we've got multiple runs in our database that created, created a file with this name in this directory. So you can actually look back over time and see what you've done. And if you run it again with the all option, you can see we've got a number of, a number of runs there. You can also uh, do it with the diff option. And that basically shows you what's different in your code between the last commit that it recorded and, and the time it was run for the, for the script. So I think that's quite handy as well, because you don't always, when you're playing around with analysis, you don't always just commit your code every time you run it, because that would be, that would be silly. You kind of play around with things. But that does mean you can end up with an output file that you didn't know exactly how you created it if you just had the commit ID, because you may have actually twiddled the parameters a bit since, since that commit. Uh, we've also got uh, a recipe GUI, um, which will load up in a moment. Uh, so this is just a, a, a nice little GUI you can look at. Uh, you've got all the information there. You can search up the top there. Um, and then you've got all your information, including a really nicely highlighted um, Git um, diff here. So you can see that, in fact, the only change I'd actually made between this and, the com this and the committed version was the fact that I changed the 100 to 100.0, which didn't matter anyway because temperature was afloat. Um, so that's basically the simple demonstration. We've talked already about how we actually store this uh, in a database. Uh, so that was all using TinyDB, which is, um, just basically stores us a JSON file in, in a, a particular folder in your, in your home directory, the .recipe folder, uh, where there's also a configuration file which allows you to change various things, tell it not to bother looking for Git things because you don't use Git on this project or tell it to um, you know, print out verbose messages so you can see what it's doing. Um, the way that we actually do this internally is using something called sys.metapar. Now, who here's heard of sys.metapar? Okay, a few people, good. Um, so sys.metapar is basically a way that you can control how Python imports modules. So it's kind of the the companion to sys.path. Sys.path is where can you look for modules. Sys.metapath is kind of how do you actually go about loading them. So the way that sys.metapath works is you basically you put um, a load of instances of objects on there, and these objects always have to have a certain interface. Um, so basically one of the interfaces is a, is a function that basically finds a module. So you call this, uh, well, Python internally will call this uh, method on the object saying, try and find me pandas. And if this, if this particular way of importing, this particular sort of built-in way of importing can, can do that, it goes, yep, here we are, I found pandas, this is where it is. And then it passes it off for another method on, on the object that says, okay, go ahead and load this module. Now, what we do with Recipe is we put some other objects into sys.metapath that do this slightly differently. So rather than trying to find the module by searching the file system, by searching every directory in sys.path to try and find it, we only do it for one module. So we have an object in there that just says, okay, I respond to pandas. If you ask me for pandas, I'll say yes. If you ask me for anything else, pff, sorry, no, no idea. And then when we load the module, we load it as normal, but then we add in this, this patching. So it happens right at the import stage there. And because you've got, um, import recipe right at the very top of your script, and it must be the very, very first line of your script, this, this system gets put in place before you start importing anything else. So if you import a uh, scikit image that also imports NumPy and SciPy, then that's fine because scikit image will then import the patched versions of NumPy and SciPy because it's working all through the same sys.metapath. So you don't end up with any problems that you've got you have some bits that are imported with patches and some bits that aren't, depending on where they were actually imported from. Um, so this whole sys.path, metapath thing is, is a bit crazy, and I had a really fun morning at the uh, hack day, basically sitting by myself in the corner of the room, um, looking into the um, details of Python import mechanisms. So we've wrapped it a bit in some, in some nice, simple 
uh, classes that make it a lot easier through this sort of class hierarchy. So basically, at the top here, you've got uh, the patch importer class, which has got all of this crazy mechanism in it, the find modules and the load modules and all sorts of stuff that I confess I don't 100% understand, but it seems to work. Uh, you've then got patch simple that makes it a lot easier to use. And then you've got the actual objects that actually do the kind of patching. And they're really simple. And I can guarantee that any one of you would be able to write a um, patch, insert your name of module here, uh, class very easily. In fact, a 10-year-old who's never programmed Python before could probably manage it. Um, this is how, how simple it is. So this is the, um, the example. This is the full code for the, for the class that patches NumPy. Uh, so we tell it it's called NumPy. OK, that's fairly simple. Uh, we basically just list the input and output functions of that module. OK, so we've got gen from text and load text. We've got save and save z and so on. And then we just tell it what the input and output wrapper is. Now, that, that's basically just a function. We've got a little helper thing here that's called create wrapper that basically says this is going to be a, a wrapper function that calls the recipe function log input or log output. Those are the functions that actually shove things into the database. Uh, it's going to take the zeroth argument. So all of these uh, functions up here, um, the zeroth argument uh, is the file name or the, the stream or whatever to write out to. Um, and we're going to say it's come from NumPy. And that's really simple. So let's have a quick look at that as well. Um, if we go back to here, if I just um, look at my configuration file, which is completely empty at the moment, I can put, uh, it's in a very simple format, but I can put in a simple flag that just says turn on debugging mode. And then if I run example script.py again, hopefully, we will see some other messages come up. This is the bit I didn't test before I came in today. So, OK, we don't actually. Um, that's a very good question as to why. OK. Oh, yep, well done. It's a typo. Thank you very much. Um, Oops, with a dot. Let's try that again. Thank you, whoever said that. There we are. So you can see what it's doing here. You can see that um, when these modules have been imported, it's done the patching that's needed. But you'll note it hasn't patched um, Psyche image, or it hasn't patched Pillow, or any of the other modules that it will work with, because those haven't been imported. Uh, it just notices, okay, I've, my first thing was import NumPy, so it patches NumPy, patches the input and output, patches pandas, patches matplotlib, and then it's also printing out a um, little bit of information just here, so you can see it, that it's inputting from this file, using pandas, outputs are there, using matplotlib, and so on. And that's basically the raw information that goes into the database. So, where next is the next question. Well, Recipe is very new. Uh, the Collaborations Workshop was, I don't know, when was Collaborations Workshop? E Mar Easter time, something like that. Um, and we wrote this, the early version of this in a day there. We then extended it and made it fully compatible with Python 2 and Python 3. We put some documentation in there. We've, we've done various things. Uh, but we've got quite a lot of ways forward we want to go with this. So we want to wrap input and output from other projects. So at the moment, um, we've got the various sort of standard most of the sort of standard uh, scientific Python libraries there. We've got NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, Matplotlib. We've got other ones like Scikit-Learn, Scikit-Image, that sort of stuff. But we want to make sure that we, we cover the whole sort of ecosystem. We want to extend the way we're dealing with all this import craziness to be able to deal with custom packages a bit better. So often people write their own packages that aren't actually installed to sort of site packages as a standard package. Uh, no one else is going to have them. Um, but they just sort of put them on their, on their Python path and, and use them. We want a way to deal with that. Um, storing metadata in output files is another way forward. So it's quite easy in certain types of output files to actually put a bit of metadata in with the file. For example, containing the recipe run ID that was used to create it. So um, in PDF files, for example, um, you can put in title and author and comments and all sorts of things. Uh, you can do similar sort of things in PNG files, I think, which is a bit like the exif data you can get for JPEGs. Uh, so th that would be really useful because you can then just run a command on a exact particular file, wherever you put it, whatever machine you've taken it to, it says, ah, this was created like this. 
Uh, storing file hashes is another interesting thing we're investigating. Uh, if we can store MD5 or SSA, SHA uh, hashes of a file, we can then actually use this partially for checking whether we've actually, whether two things are actually the same, but also we can definitely look at a file and go, okay, how definitely was, was this created? Uh, we want to do a bit more with the database. Um, so being able to annotate runs, we put a little comment on here saying, you know, this is the one that really worked and I want to use this in my thesis. Uh, exporting things, sharing things, potentially through uh, shared MongoDB servers and so on. And then the big one, automated testing and better documentation. Now, I've already done a bit of the better documentation stuff, but as you, if anyone's, I suspect some of you may have gone to the GitHub page while I've been talking, um, and you will have found there's a readme there, but there's nothing much else. The readme is reasonably comprehensive, but it, it could do with a bit more. Automated testing is an interesting one, because actually the sort of thing this module does is quite difficult to test. You can't just do a standard sort of unit test on, on the whole thing working because it is based on all this importing stuff. So I haven't quite figured that out yet. And if anyone wants to come and talk to me about that afterwards, that'd be brilliant. And so that's what next for, for me and the rest of my team. Uh, but it's your turn. Um, please go ahead and, and install it. Have a play. Pip install Recipe. It's nice and easy. No crazy dependencies. It's all pure Python. Should install anywhere, anything. Let me know if it doesn't. Um, please add pull requests and issues on the GitHub page, if it doesn't support the output or input functions that you use, write one of those really simple classes that a 10-year-old could write and uh, submit it as a pull request, and we'll accept it almost certainly. And then also, go ahead and win a Nobel Prize if you feel like it. Uh, if you do, if you could send some of the money to me and the rest of the team, it'd be really great. Thank you very much. Thanks for the nice presentation. Um, are there any questions? Okay. Uh, do you have any solutions for scripts that uh, read and write with standard C++? Uh, so the question, just, just for the recording, the question was, do we have any, any way of dealing with scripts that write to standard input and standard output? Uh, no, at the moment we don't. Um, I can picture a number of ways in which we could. Um, so I'll definitely add that as an issue and um, look into that. Thank you. Is that possible to tuck in recursive uh, import, let's say I uh, import a, a module and a module import another module, but uh, purely for the code changing, not input, but for example, I, I row a function and I change the function in the other module and I run the notebook. Is, is that possible to track that too? Or? Um, so tracking through things like the notebook is a little bit more difficult at the moment, but we have got a bit of infrastructure in there to support that. So if you change things, and re-import. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure exactly how that works at the moment, but that's definitely something we're we're trying to improve as well. Um, we've got a way uh, at the moment when you do the import recipe line itself, that's what actually sets up all of the sys.metapath stuff. Um, if you then do re-import using the IPython notebook, I suspect it would work, but I haven't tested it. Um, but there is also a way of actually forcing a new run to be created. So there's recipe dot I can't what it is, we create run or something that actually allows you to um, force it to go, okay, you know, I've done all my patching and everything, but now I want to record this next thing I'm doing as an entirely new run, clear all my entries and start again with a, list, a blank list of outputs and inputs. So that can be useful halfway through a sort of interactive session, for example. Uh, I was wondering um, how uh, does it perform if you have very big or very many inputs or output files? Um, Good question. I don't honestly know at the moment. We haven't done huge amounts of performance testing. Um, in terms of, um, so I think there's, there's two sides to that. There's the overhead of writing to the database when you actually read the input or output, and there's the kind of import machinery and all this sort of patching that happens. But the patching only happens once. Um, even if you actually have import NumPy in loads of different places, Python doesn't actually re-import it every time. It's, it's already imported, so it's already dealt with that. So that's, that's not a problem. Um, in terms of the actual mechanics of writing to the database, that, that I can imagine if you're reading you know, hundreds, thousands of, of tiny little files every, you know, in, a, in a tight for loop, yes, that may be, able to be an overhead, but I guess that's reasonably rare, although I'm sure you're about to tell me that you do that quite a lot. Um, and so hopefully it won't be a problem, but we can look into speeding up some of the database access uh, if necessary. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about loading and uh, saving the output. If the uh, modules, modules used for that are in C, so you can't write something models dot 
something equals to. How to solve this with your module? Thank you. Good question. Um, I'm not 100% sure at the moment. Um, I know some of the things we have written patches for already um, actually are implemented in C at the very lowest level, but they've got, they've got Python wrappers sort of over them, so some of the Pandas stuff, some of the NumPy stuff goes actually out to C. Um, so I think it's probably gonna be okay. I think it, it may even just work, uh, but I definitely have to, have to test it to see whether it did work. Uh, but yeah, we can have a chat at lunchtime or something and have a go and see, see if it works or not. Okay, could the next speaker please come down and attach her or his laptop? Okay, um, there was one more question. Mm -hmm. Is that thing sort of separatable from the for this particular project? So I don't know, do you use that for any arbitrary reason you might want to override any sort of thing? Or is it very tied to the specific use case? Okay, so just for the recording, the um the question there was uh, how the infrastructure for doing this is tied to Recipe or whether it can be used for other kind of importing things, uh, the sort of class hierarchy I was talking about. Um it's it's, it is fairly decoupled. Um, some bits will probably be, I mean, it's reasonably specifically based around wrapping it to do inputs and outputs, but you could easily um, wrap it to put, you know, call any other function. Um, so it should be fairly extendable, and it's reasonably well documented as well, reasonably. Thanks.